Confessor Dead. That's my clickbait title. <laughs> uh, but it worked out here. So I got some questions. Uh, so there's no wrong answers here. Just a show of hands as we go through them. I got a lot of them, so I'm going to fly through them pretty quick. If you agree with it, you can put your hand up. Unit tests are critical to stable code. Okay. Uh, unit tests are critical when refactory. A little bit more. Unit tests let me sleep at night. Not so much. Integration tests let me sleep at night. Okay, a little bit more. We have a staging environment. Most people have a staging environment. I trust my staging environment. <laughs> Fewer hands. Integration tests are too slow. Oh, big hand up on that one. <laughs> Integration tests require too much setup and tear down. Okay. So what's the right mix here? A, B, or C? <laughs> How much test coverage should you have? B. B? Okay. Fully tested, 100%. Yeah. All right. Is that you? Um, so <laughs> how, how much time should you spend on your unit tests in terms of your time you spend on your code? Tough one. It's hard to answer to. Um, my team actively manages a production system. DevOps, I would hope so. <laughs> Uh, my team uses a continuous integration system. And when I, when I say continuous integration, I mean that it gates on code submissions. So if someone submits code and it breaks, they can't land it. We use an automated deployment system, a CD system. Okay. It's just not as many hands as I thought we were looking up for that one. Uh, testing is a QA issue. Oh, let's go ahead. Uh, my team uh, depends on an operations team. All right, so you've got a separate ops team. Uh, my team uses a monitoring and alerting system. Okay, a lot of common hands here. Uh, our application is fully instrumented. Oh, you'll, you'll, love this, you'll love this talk. Um, my company has a strong DevOps culture. All right, fewer. All right, thanks. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're definitely just that. So, uh, so my name is Sandy Walsh. Uh, I'm a software developer. Uh, sort of went started off as a software developer and then went through the ranks of management. And then I realized this sucks and got back into writing code again. Um, so um, I thought it would be interesting though to compare that timeline with the languages. So I spent a lot of time with C, C++, Java. And you notice that I stopped Java when I stopped managing people. Um, Python's always been there for me, recently been doing a lot of Go, uh, but then I thought I'd also compare it to the methodologies. So started off with Spiral, which was sort of like a precursor to extreme programming. Uh, extreme programming, of course, got on in Scientology and Scrum. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, so lately, been doing a lot of kan Kanban, uh, which has been working out really well, but then I thought about looking at that from where this whole unit test thing came from. Um, so, and it's around that sort of XP scrum time where that was really the rise of uh, unit testing and behavior uh, driven development, test driven development. You know, you start to see frameworks around it like JUnit. Um, the whole idea of automate everything, don't repeat yourself, which is kind of important. Um, it's interesting that Spiral and Kanban don't really force those things. They're more about just the process of writing the software, not about the software itself. Maybe that's why I like it. I don't know. So now I'm working for a company called Planet. I started there um, almost four or five years ago. And we make these satellites. If you grab one of these little paper craft things down there, you can make your own little satellite. You make a satellite there? See? You can make a dove. Um, so it's a bunch of ex NASA guys who started these. and. Uh, these little doves go up we, on almost every rocket that goes up. Um, we send some doves up. And they go on either International Space Station orbit, which is a different orbit, uh, than Sun Synchronous orbit, which is uh, you know, pole to pole. And as the Earth turns and these go around, it's like a line scanner for the whole planet. So every day we take pictures. This is one I took, or that I took 
uh, from a couple of days ago. I think it was on the 15th. That was the, be the best one for no cloud cover. That was Halifax Harbor. You can see some of the boats and stuff out there. Uh, so we bring down about 1.5 million images a day. We <coughs> range in size from uh, like a flak file to a Blu-ray disc, uh, depending on which satellites take the images. This is sort of our stack. This is how the whole flow sort of works. So up here we have our doves. They go to a ground station. We've got ground stations all over the world. Uh, we pump those images and all that data into Google Cloud. We used to be on the AWS. We switched. Then we have a big processing pipeline where all the stuff goes through. So rectification takes the image and then maps it to where it should be on the Earth. Um, color correction, cloud detection, create mosaics out of it. So if you fit on Google Maps and you, you know you scroll, you see those little squares popping up. Yeah, it's mosaics and tile servers that, that do all that work. Then we have a big catalog where we keep all that stuff and you can search for your imagery. So you can say, show me everything collected in 2018 over North America with less than 10% cloud cover, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then we have a bunch of APIs that sit on top of it. They sit on top of Kubernetes. So the tile servers, mosaic servers, search engines. Uh, the ordering piece is a piece that I was working on uh, the last couple of years. Um, so that's when you want to go in and order some of the software. And this is sort of the thing that sort of precipitated this, this talk was, was my work on that. <laughs> then of course we have the edge side that comes in. So that's all the rate limiting and authentication and everything. That's where the users come in. And then we're adding more and more services on the back end. So machine learning, analytics, all that sort of stuff. We're gonna come back to this slide quite a bit. So, and if you've got any questions, just yell them out. Small enough crowd here so we can do that. <laughs> But the reason I mention it is because when I first started, uh, I think it was the first week I was there, um, we were out having a, a beer with some of the people and just you know meeting everyone. And I mentioned that I was sort of really interested in unit testing. I was sort of a very strong advocate of unit testing. And one of the guys I was talking to goes, "Oh, he goes unit tests. He says this is awful. He says it's like it's like taking your code and putting it in a barrel and filling the barrel with concrete. And you can't you can't change it, and it's all it's so rigid." And, I, and so I was, I was shocked. I mean, I, I had just come off of OpenStack, which is a big open source cloud fabric. Um, and that was very unit test heavy, so it was open source. So everyone, you, you couldn't you know, contribute code without having matching unit tests for everything that you did. So um, my world was sort of destroyed from hearing that unit tests were so bad. I couldn't really figure out like, you know, why that was, why someone would have that opinion. But the more I thought about it, I, you know, trying to run and maintain a production system, the more I thought, well, am I really getting any comfort from the unit tests that I'm writing? Is it really, uh, you know, making my life easier? And, and the thing that I, I, the conclusion I came to was that not for the amount of work that I'm putting into it. I'm spending a lot of time on these unit tests and the bang for the buck just isn't there. Um, so when I look at that, that ordering system, when I look at this whole stack, I look at all the places where things can go wrong, all the things in red, and my unit tests are not a very big portion of that. And they're not gonna address those problems. Yes, they're gonna identify an error, like you know, how do I deal with an error, but generally something else is gonna bust before that busts. So all my tests pass, my code is correct, but the world around it has changed. And that's the sort of thing that I think now is what, what you need to, to start thinking about. And if you're in production, if you've got a production system, you've typically got a monitoring system. There was a lot of hands here that went up already. You've got an alerting system, you've got a monitoring system in place. So if you know you're gonna have a monitoring system in production, why not start coding to it right now? Don't leave it as an afterthought. Start working with it and be making it a first class citizen. <coughs> so let's just take a couple of minutes and just go through some terminology here. Um, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page. When I talk about unit tests, I talk about a single method, a single function, and testing the crap out of it. And that means that any branches, any ifs in here, any exception catches, try catch blocks, uh, you know, fence post errors, all that sort of stuff, I'm focusing on one thing and I'm making sure all the inputs and all the outputs are correct for every code branch. It typically falls apart though when you get into Lucy type languages. If you're writing in Python, you're writing in Ruby, stuff like that, uh, unit tests can really fall apart because you can't guarantee what's coming in, right? You, you Assume you're going to get the right data, but someone can just throw something crazy at you and cause the problem. So then we get into functional tests. Functional tests sort of expanded out beyond that single function, beyond that single method, 
and you're starting to grab little groups of two or three functions and you're making little little chains in there, maybe a module, you know, so you're, but you're still sort of fence posting, you're mocking, you're doing your tests and your fakes and all that sort of stuff in there. Um, a little bit more complex, a little bit more fragile, a little harder to understand. You know, I always view unit tests as being a form of documentation. They should be able to look at, at the test and figure out what the code is doing. So it's, it's more of an educational tool than anything. When you start to get into functional tests, that makes it a little bit more difficult. And then finally, you have integration tests. Now, integration tests, typically, you'd run against your, uh, your sandbox or your staging environment. And the idea is that you're basically deploying a whole other system that's just not going out into production. It's, it's living on, in its own little world and it's not going to get touched by, by actual users. Uh, the reality is that um, staging never matches in uh, production, right? There's all sorts of syncing tools and stuff you can do with it, but it's never exactly right. It's not bug for bug compatible, as we say. Um, so, and also it's the most fragile. It's the most complex and the most fragile. If you touch something, things are going to start breaking when you get into integration tests. So if my unit tests are so good, why does PagerDuty go off at 3 a.m.? shouldn't, but it does, and we all know that. So what I'm proposing is that let's have a small amount of unit tests, let's worry about the code, but then let's start looking at that monitoring stack. And let's look, look at all the things that we need in here that we're going to need anyway. We're going we're to build this stuff anyway. So why not just start working with this now as a first class system? Our continuous integration environment, the monitoring system, the tracing environment, and I'll, I'll explain what all these are afterwards. Structured logging, events, dashboards, alerting, chat ops. Um, so these are all the things. I, and, and as DevOps, as a DevOps group, you're probably already familiar with a lot of these terms anyway, but this is really about DevOps. This is how do how developers start to take on that ops mentality. So when we talk about DevOps, it, it's not a role. It's not, you know, we've all heard it a million times. It's not, you don't hire a DevOps, right? You have a DevOps mentality. Um, so typically you've got development, you've got operations, and, and the two have to work together to make sure that they can solve problems, you know, equally. The easier way to say that is don't throw your code over the fence. You don't just say, hey, ops, here you go. Now maintain it. Because that's a lesson that we already learned in the 2000s. We learned that with QA, right? The way it used to be was you'd write code, you'd throw it over the fence to QA and say, is this good? And they'd come back and file tickets and stuff. And we learned that you can't do that. So QA got pulled into the fold. And QA became, you know, like another form of testing, but they, it wasn't the primary form of testing. So what we see now is the rise of the service owner. So you, you've got a large production infrastructure, you've got a lot of microservices, you've got all these different pieces. You have a little group of people that are taking care of these services. They're, they're working together to make sure the service stays alive. So it's development plus the care and feeding of it. So I've got all these pieces, all these types of tests that I've been running against my service. And at the end of the day, I'm thinking, well, you know what? The integration tests are brittle, but they let me sleep at night. They're the one thing that when I run it, I know that from soup to nuts, this thing is good, right? So I've got to deal with the brittleness. I've got to deal with the fragility of it. So um, yeah, I, I want to see how that whole thing is going to work. <laughs> so imagine you've got a, a team of uh, unbelievable QA people that are going to beat up your product in every way that you can possibly imagine, <coughs> right? in even ways that you couldn't imagine. Well, that's that's your users, right? They're out there now. They're already going to be beaten on it. So why not use them as your additional QA department? And the first pushback you always get is that, well, people are going to see our mistakes. And we're going to see your mistakes. It's going to happen. You're going to have bugs, right? The question is, do you want, do you want, do you want the users to see them and you don't know about it, or do you want the users to see it and you know about it? Obviously, you want to know about it. So my, my clickbait title, unit tests are dead. There are some exceptions. Mm -hmm. Every system has got that little gem of code in there, which is this, you know, the, the magic, where the magic happens in the software. The rest of it is all boilerplate and common stuff that you do for every service that you write. But the inside of every piece of code is that little magic piece. And that's the piece that I'm going to focus on unit testing. All these red slides I'm going to show you are ones that, these are the things that I sort of sit, said in my head, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. Like, I'm going to try and change my mentality about this. This is not a prescription. This is just, this whole presentation is just more or less the thought process that I went through dealing with this problem. 
Um, so I'm going to focus on the unit tests that are, are very specific, where they, they deal with that little gem of the service. Uh, there might be another exception for open source, because a lot of people are going to be grabbing your code and they're going to be trying to run it. So maybe unit tests make more sense in that environment as well. This is, I'm really talking about a production environment that you're dealing with yourself. So that piece of code, that little gem, that little, you know, that piece of logic that says permit everyone in finance uh, and sales except for Bob, that gnarly little piece of code that everyone hates, right? I'm not going to worry about unit test coverage. I'm not going to worry about testing every condition. I'm not going to worry about the configuration or the setup code. I'm not going to worry about fence post errors. I'm not going to worry about validation or response code. Sacrilege, you say. I'm not going to worry about the just general error handling, the, the, you know, the low hanging fruit. I'm going to worry about the, the most important stuff. The place where all the regressions are likely to occur. When you're refactoring, when you're changing code, that's the stuff that's going to break. That's the stuff that's going to set off the alarms. I'm going to worry about the, the, the code that you don't want to be reading at 3 o'clock in the morning. All right, that's the place where I'll, I'll have some tests. So my unit tests are going to be very few. They're going to be laser focused on what they had to achieve. They're going to be readable, maintainable, and they're going to be super fast and easy to run in CI. All right, we've all seen this like XKCD, right? You know, can't, uh, I'm busy compiling. Well, now it's, I'm now waiting for CI tests to run. Right? You can't run CI tests that are going to take two hours to run at three o'clock in the morning when you got production outage. So I don't want to wait for gate to pass. You end up doing this anyway. Right? <laughs> you package up the code, you deploy it, you wait to see what happens. So for extreme programming, you know, I don't know if anyone's done extreme programming back in the day. I'm, I'm the token old guy here. Um, so uh, you know the, the mantra was that testing is hard, so test all the time. And now what we see with the DevOps mentality is that test production all the time. So run your, start running your integration tests against production. So this is where we start to see the, the, the rise of observability. The, the, you know, we used to call it monitoring, we used to call it alerting, we used to call it telemetry. Uh, but now the buzzword is observability. And, it, and it's a very similar type thing to the way we think about DevOps, uh, that it's a mindset, it's not a tool set. Um, and these are sort of the pillars of observability, that you've got a monitoring system, you've got instrumentation in place in the code, and I'll touch on that afterwards. Typically structured logging, right? So you're not just sending out a syslog, you're actually sending out like a JSON payload, uh, NDJSON or something like that. You've got alerts, you've got dashboards that you can see what's happening. Uh, and you're gonna, the instrumentation part of that is very important. So you're not treating your services like black boxes. Uh, you know there's, there's context around when the event occurs. So you're not just saying that something broke or you got a 500 or an exception was thrown. You're getting all the gory details about you know, who was the <laughs> user that did it and what machine was it on and all, all that information. And actually, just let me go back here. The last point is important, that the non-service owners can inspect the deployment. Right? So people who don't really know the system can even go in and find out from a dashboard or from a, a page of duty alert what's going on. So when I talk about telemetry, telemetry is it's the scientific machine that you know, transmits information or records information. And so you gather the information and then you send it on somewhere. That's telemetry historically. Monitoring is looking at those readings that come out. We have telemetry on our satellites. Not only do they send down pretty pictures, but they send down all kinds of other information. What's the temperature? What's the battery life? You know, what's the CPU doing? What's, you know, how much disk space? They run a Ubuntu, by the way, or, well, I don't think, I think they used to. They were running Linux, anyway. Um, so yeah, you know, all that monitoring stuff. So monitoring typically has been on the ops world, right? And now service owners need it. So let's get it out there. That's just typically what you used to see with monitoring in the Nagios days. You'd see, you know, what's the CPU? What's the disk space? You know, what's how many 500s are we getting? How big is the queue, bro? All that sort of stuff. But now we, it doesn't tell you why. That you know, why did the CPU spike? What happened in there? So we want to measure the internals of the service, and that's when I talk about instrumentation. That's putting something in the code that's going to talk to that monitoring system that's going to give you all the things that you would normally get out of your unit tests. <coughs> this is weird. You know, you see the comments in the code all the time, right? Should never reach here. <laughs> and it does, right? Uh, 
There's some great metrics that you can emit. Uh, the number of retries, that's a great leading indicator that something's about to go pear-shaped. Right? If you just hit the third retry on something, you probably knew that coming in already, that the something, something's about to go bad. Um, you expect it to have a value for something and you didn't have one, so you fall back to some default value because you're a safe programmer. You put all those guards in place. But the fact that you fell back to a default should tell you something that something's wrong. Why did you fall back to a default? Uh, catching all those top-level exceptions. And there's a bunch of tools that, that for years have been doing this. Um, yeah, Sentry and uh, you know, some of these, I, I can't think of all of them now, but there's a bunch of them that used to grab those top-level exceptions and just put them in a dashboard for you. But there's a million tools out there now for doing this. You know, there's Honeycomb, Signal Effects, Prometheus is a big open source one, especially if you're in a uh, cloud native uh, architecture, Datadog, Google's got Stack Driver, uh, there's CloudWatch, I think it's AWS's one. There's, you don't have to build this stuff. There's a million of them out there. And they're all making a square circle. You know, some of them are better at certain things and some are, some are worse. And also, it's not really a stack that you want to build yourself. Uh, you can if you want, but there's lots of tools out there. So let's, let's go through some of the terminology here. So metrics. Metrics are those little, those little pings that you send up that something happened. They're small, they're, they're, they're very lightweight, um, there's different types of metrics. There's counters, you know, how many 500s did I get in the last hour? Or a rate, um, you know, I've, uh, this user has sent in so many requests per second. Uh, a gauge is literally like a one to, one to 100. CPU is at 100. CPU is at 20. That's a gauge. Uh, and then you can get into histograms and summary things. So, and, that, and that's really, really handy, those rolling averages. You know, having a window of the last hour rolling those values up and giving you like a, a, a quartile or some sort of percentage. Uh, it's very useful. And typically the way these work is that you have a service and they broadcast out on a UDP socket uh, out to an aggregator somewhere sitting out there and about every 10 seconds or so it'll take all that, all that data that it collected, all those metrics, and it'll add, you know, summarize them up for 10 seconds and then it'll blast it out to your telemetry service. So it'll start collecting all that data. And there's a bunch of these aggregations of stats D, collect D. Um, but the service never talks directly to the telemetry service. Um, because you can't have monitoring breaking down production. If, if your monitoring system is breaking production, then you've got another problem. So there is that isolation there. With the UDP packet, there's no handshake. It's fired for yet, right? Um, so you want these non-blocking operations of your monitoring system. Uh, the format is typically of just a tiny, tiny little string, it looks something like that. So you have a, a metric name, what type of metric is it, so this is a counter in this case, and then you have a tag. Um, so I can look at this and say, how many users are online? And then if I want, I can sort of qualify it and say how many from, are in from China, for example. So that those tags are really important. Um, in the early days of monitoring, we used to have to worry about cardinality. So you'd have these these metrics, like if you want to do that, that China metric, right? You could do it this way. You'd say my service dot live dot China dot user dot live, right? So that's the live environment. My service live environment in China users online. That gets really expensive after a while. You end up with these big stacks of metrics, and they're they're hard to organize. The better way to do it is use tags. So you just say my service users online, and then you have a tag for live, a tag for staging, a tag for local testing, whatever. And a tag for China. Now you've got one metric and you can flip the dimensions and start looking at those other metrics. And all, all the monitoring services and aggregators will yield to that. Um, and I say low card now, you don't want to put a timestamp in there. You don't want to put a, a UUID in there. You want to have something that's you know, got measured bounds. There's also the Prometheus model. Prometheus is, like I say, the, uh, <coughs> another open source monitoring tool and it does a pull model. So in this case, you expose an endpoint, like a slash metrics endpoint, and Prometheus will come around every now and then and just grab what you got. So you do your aggregation yourself, you do your summarization, and it will pull from you. Uh, and that's a little bit safer. Uh, it, it shouldn't break down production. If you've got problems on your metrics endpoint, then that's sort of on you. But it's a different, it's a different approach, and it's, uh, it's less, less services to manage. So metrics. Metrics are, are, are lossy. Typically, they're UDP, they're gonna fall on the floor, they're gonna drop out, you have to deal with it. Um, there's no context in it. 
So a user came online, you go, well, you know what, where did that come from? You don't really know. But they're really handy. You just start getting those up and you start seeing your dashboards and you can get a feel for how your system works. The second part of the observability stack is structured logging. I say distributed because you need to aggregate all those logs. You don't want to, if you've got a Kubernetes cluster and you've got 50 pods out there, you don't want to have to go into every pod and start reading the log files for it. You want to bring that all together and be able to search in one place. Some people use Splunk and those sort of tools, um, but again, table stakes, they've all got it now. Um, so in this case, you've got a larger payload. It's, it's structured in the sense of it's JSON, it's not syslog, so you can actually get some more information in there and it's easier to parse. Um, you can put all kinds of interesting headers in there to pass on from one system to the next. Um, and, and the distribution of logs is a solved problem. Right? It's been done for years. And there's, there's a, all, every different vendor has their own way of dealing with it uh, for aggregation, taking the packaging of those log files and sending them on. So tracing is kind of like structured logging, but you what you do is you have the header in it that says, here's where the call originated from, and then you pass that on with service A calls service B calls service C calls service D, and you pass down those headers along with all those other requests that you do. And now you've got a history, right from the point that the user came into your system, to the time that they hit the database or whatever it is that they're doing, and then all the way back. And you can start to look at all these, uh, all these traces through your system. That you, it's like a tracer bullet. Just boom, fire it into your system and just see it go out. But you don't do it all the time. That's a very expensive thing to do. But if I want to find out, you know, where something broke, I can see from the user when they came in, when they hit our edge, which load balancer threw it out there, when they hit the ordering system, went down to the compute, when it got into Kubernetes, hit the catalog, went down to Google Cloud, and I can see that whole trace all the way down. That's super valuable. I think you can find latency problems, you can find regressions, you know, just Anywhere along the way, if someone did a new deployment, you can find out you know, where, where the changes happen. There's some beautiful tools on that. So for log aggregation, I mean, that was typically, you know, and I say tip was and typically, <coughs> five years ago maybe, that was, that was the way you did it. And that's old school now. That's, the, the tools out there now for doing this sort of stuff are phenomenal. You don't have to maintain your own Elasticsearch cluster. So this is a screen, for example, from Stackdriver. And Stackdriver is a, is a good tool, but the UI really sucks. But it, it just gives you all, all the structured log. You can go and look at all your log entries across all your clusters. You can do some really complex queries on it, filter it out. Um, it's pretty neat. And look at that, I mean, look at that payload. You get so much, so much context and stuff in there. It's, it's great for debugging stuff. So the last part then is the dashboard. That's the pretty pictures that everyone wants to see. So, you know, charts and graphs and heat maps and high lows and candlesticks and trends and everything. And they all have all these integrations out to all these other systems. So, when an alert happens, you don't have to have pager duty go off and it's a low priority alert. You have this going to the Slack channel. You go, there's something that's not great. <laughs> and then, okay, I'll look at it. So, um, not everything has to be, you know, bells ringing and, and, and red lights flashing. So, that's a, that's a typical. Typical dashboard right there, um, and you know the, the tools are just great for the signal effects, and you can get a get a really good sense for what's happening in your system because you can tune it. because these are not just showing five hundreds and memory usage and stuff; they're showing internal to your system. So if if you have an instrument program, you can actually see stuff in in the parlance of your application, like terms that your application uses, which is super handy. And this, this was the old dashboard back in the unit test days, right? Anyone remember this? JUnit? This, this would be a, a unit test runner. And then green, all the test paths. It must be good. So we've come a long way from that. So the green slides. So, uh, so once I, I went through all that sort of revelation about you know what I wanted to do, here's the things that, or what I didn't want to do, here's the things that I do want to do. Going forward, I want to, I want to start thinking as a developer, uh, with these sort of things in mind. So I want to get really good at deploying, and I, more importantly, I want to get really good at rolling back, right? Because things are going to change, and things are going to break, and I'm going to know very quickly when I roll stuff out. So how's going to unwind that? Super quick. Kubernetes and, and those sort of tools make that super simple. Um, 
you know, container, container-based structure, your container-based architectures, and, and group deployment tools make that pretty simple. Make sure you've got an on-call rotation and start early, right? You're, you're gonna need one. There's gonna be on-call, so you might as well start it now. And get everyone familiar, because it gets, when you start seeing those alerts going off, you get a you know, familiarity with the feed of the system, and that's important. So, and then I'm gonna let monitoring alerting uh, alerting worry about all the rest of the stuff. Because when you focus on monitoring, you focus on percentage of stack as opposed to percentage of code. And when we talk about coverage and unit tests, that's a more important percentage, percentage of stack. Um, so it's easy for us to hide on our side of the software development wall. Uh, you probably heard the expression for developers, which is that our job is a shit. There's, there's a great quote um, if I, uh, CJ, which is, uh, I'll read it out, uh, shipping a product feels good like when someone stops hitting you. Your job is completing the product, fixing the bugs, and shipping. If bugs need fixing, fix them. The documentation needs writing, write it. If, codes need, if code needs testing, test it. It's all part of shipping. You don't get paid to program, you get paid to ship. You go to your job. And that's, you know, I had that tattooed on me. I, I, I lived by that mantra for, for a long time. But it's sort of changed now. Now our job is to ship and to keep the ship afloat. That's the, that's the sort of DevOps mentality, I think. So if we help ops, it will help us. If we can give them more context, right? if we can give them more information about what's going on, they don't have to look at it like a black box where they just have to poke it and go, I think this is what's wrong. Right? They can look right into it and see what's inside of it. So if you want to see a bug get fixed, you put an alert on it. Right? When you've got your on-call rotation and you've, got, and you've got people get engaged, that bug's going to be the first thing fixed on Monday morning. And it's easy to do. Uh, you've got log messages in your code already, right? And one thing that I did was I put on any warn or error level logging message, I have a little wrapper around my logger and that also sends the metric out. So now I know I hit some weird funky little piece of code that should never happen and that'll show up on my dashboard. And if I see that happening a lot, I know I've got a problem. So maybe I should go back and look at that code again. Um, so you don't you don't need to put you know all over your code. You don't need to have a line that says here's here's a log entry and then here's another block of code that says emit a metric. Make a little utility, wrap that stuff up, and just make it super simple. So less code is better. You're going to have log messages in there anyway. Um, so unit tests used to be be the best way, but now I think an active dashboard is the best way to ensure quality in your software. You get that heartbeat when you start seeing that chart. That, that tick to it, you understand what that is, that you know, that's, oh, that's, that's my polar, that's going out and pulling the data. Well, look, it just got a hit. And you, you get familiar with that, you start to see those graphs, you get to understand that heartbeat. Um, that's, that's so critical. And in order to get that heartbeat, if you don't have traffic, run your integration tests against it, right? Do it every 15 minutes. Don't, it doesn't have to be a killer integration test that's gonna bring down the house. It can be a, do the happy day scenario. Do, the, do that 80% of stuff that you're going to get all the time, the easy one. Just make sure, do a ping just to make sure that things are working, right? But start to add a little bit more complexity to it, a little bit more until eventually you've got a very rich set of integration tests. And then you're going to get your baseline. You know those integration tests are going to run every 15 minutes or so. So now there's my tick. There's my heartbeat on my charts. So when something goes wrong, you can say, you can have analytics behind it. And say this happened 10% of the time in this situation as opposed to something looks weird and this just seems busted. Right? You don't want to be that hand waving thing. Um, there's lots of deployment strategies that you can use. Uh, anyone using canaries for deployment? Blue green? Cool. So there's lots of ways that you can you can rule out new code. Uh, canaries, um, you have your cluster of pods or your containers running, uh, and then as you upgrade, you'll upgrade a very small percentage. So let's say 10% of all my pods are gonna get upgraded to the newest version. Now I'm gonna look at my dashboards, and I'm gonna use my tags, and I'm gonna find out what's the error rate on my 1.1 version versus my 1.0 version. Did anything change? If it looks good, I'll start changing the percentages. I'll go 20%, 50%, 100%, and then eventually 1.0 is dead. The other way you can do it is blue-green. So typically in here, you're switching big chunks of the cluster. Right, so what you're going to do is you have two of them running side by side, equal size, equal capacity, but you're only going to spend, let's say, 
couple of minutes over on the new version. 1.1, let's, let's run it for 10 minutes and see what happens. And that will go back. Let's run it for 20 minutes and see what happens. That will go back. And then you can start looking at your dashboards that way and see what happens. Some really cool strategies for, for doing that stuff. And that, that, this is where I think a lot of the innovation is really coming in, is long node deployment strategies and then finding those changes. Make your alerts point to your runbooks. So what's a runbook? Everyone has a different definition of it. Standardize on what your run book's going to be. Your run book is that one wiki page or whatever it is that says, something went wrong. Here's everything you need. Right? If, if you were on a desert island, what's the one page you need to help solve this problem? And this is the sort of stuff we put in ours. Who's the team responsible for it? Who's the experts? Where do I find the dashboard? What are the key metrics I should be looking at? What are the pages you're going to be uh, uh, channels that I'm going to be looking at, the Slack channels that I can reach people on. Where it's a ticketing system, what's the pre prefix or the labels in the ticketing system that I should be looking for on this? Maybe this is a report problem already. Which cluster does it run in? What's the container image prefix? You know, there's all debugging tips, FAQs, all that. That's your one pager, that's your key to life, right? And every alert that comes out of PagerDuty or whatever alerting system you're using should link to that page. So if someone is new to the team and it just came on and they're not really familiar with being on call, then at least they know which page to go to. They don't have to try and find it. Right? That, that, that one phone call is going to tell them everything they need. So now you can start to reach out and start to look at the beat of the related systems. If I'm worried about the order system and I want to find out how the compute system is doing, which I'm heavily dependent on, I can start looking at their dashboards. I can start to see what their beats look like. Okay? Start to figure that out. How's the fabric knit together? Uh, and then I can start looking at their run books, find out what they're worried about, what keeps them up at night. Start talking to them about, you know, what, what's the what's their affairs and stuff. How much how much load are we putting on their system? Do they consider us their friend or a foe? Um, so the yellow slides here now are sort of things that we're not what we do, we don't do, you know, we're sort of looking at um, service mesh. Anyone running service meshes? So service meshes are, like there's Linkerd, there's Istio, there's a whole bunch of different uh, serv uh, service meshes. And basically what it is, like a proxy in front of every service. So you have a proxy in front of your database, you have a proxy in front of every pod, you have a proxy in front of DNS, you have a proxy in front of you name it. It's all there. And what it gives you is it gives you a single place where, A, you can get all this free monitoring. So you see every path that goes through, you get free tracing, you see how all the calls are propagated because they can put the, the headers in it for you. Um, you get free dashboards, you can see what's happening. If you want to reroute something, you can short circuit it, reroute it, do it right in, in the service mesh, as opposed to having to change configuration and stuff. So it's a separate tool that they have. Of course, the, the ops person is going to look at this and go, I don't want to put a proxy in front of everything, that sounds like a nightmare. But there are tools for making this happen. And if you're running on something like Kubernetes or some sort of you know <coughs> good container uh, structure, it makes it easier. Uh, and a lot of them you're going to get for free now too with some of the big hosts at all. <coughs> GKE, for example, uses Istio, so you can turn that on just almost with a click of a button. Um, the nice thing about the service mesh is that you have less lines of code in your application dedicated to telemetry. Now you're letting the fabric take care of a lot of it. Chat ops. Um, everyone's got their spell book of incantations, right? That they run in bash, find out when something's going wrong. They take it, they, they, everyone hoards them, and they put them in their last pass secret note. You know, oh, this is the one that I wanted to run. And then you share them around and stuff. But all that stuff can be pushed into uh, a bot and watching on the Slack channel. So if you want to you know, reboot a, uh, a cluster or whatever, you can do it in chat ops, and then everyone can see it. All the other people on your team can see the commands that you're running, and they can run from there. Um, so it's a, it's a really handy way to do that sort of stuff. This is probably what you're thinking. This seems like way more work. Um, it's not. It's out there. You just got to use it. Um, don't build it. Right? Who, who, would, who would build their own CI CD system? Right? Don't do it. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's about as difficult as, as running a logging library. Right? If you make some nice little utilities, wrap all this stuff up, and if you can put a log message into your code, then you can do telemetry, you can do all this other stuff. There's a great quote from, uh, this, this guy did a talk in 2008, and if you search around on YouTube, you can find it, but sufficiently advanced monitoring is indistinguishable from testing. I think that's a good one. So, oops, sorry. 
Yeah. A few more questions. I was thinking about unit tests. Oh, wow. Confidence. I think our system could benefit from more observability. Yeah. Yeah, the unit tests. <laughs> no. I think the second one, sorry. I think that's, that's the sort of the safe measure. Cool. Thanks.